So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, constitutional conversation. Uh, I am Michael McConnell, a professor here. A uh, few of you are first year students and I haven't uh, met you yet and I see a few other new faces. So uh, welcome especially to uh, first timers. Uh, tonight uh, is a real pleasure to welcome uh, Peter Prendeville and Russ Feingold uh, to talk about their new book, The Constitution in Jeopardy, which is about the dangers of a constitutional convention and other thoughts really about how to uh, go about uh, responsibly uh, amending uh, the U.S. Constitution. Let me just say a few words about each of them. Uh, Peter was a student here just last year, <laughs> and so I have to say, and he was in a few of my classes, I have to say how proud it makes me as a teacher to see Peter here as co-author of an important book just one year after uh, graduating from law school. It's just uh, a fantastic achievement. And, you know, Russ Feingold probably, uh, he should probably introduce me instead of the other way around. Uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, knows of him from his long and distinguished career in uh, the United States Senate. I would just say personally that uh, Senator Feingold was, in my, pr in my opinion, one of those rare statesmen who voted his conscience even when he was all by himself and even when his party was uh, uh, not on the, uh, on the same wavelength with him. And I have to say, uh, I, I really uh, admired him then and admire him uh, now. Uh, he has been, by the way, a non-resident fellow of the Constitutional Law Center, so we uh, have uh, 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 no, numerous occasions to uh, cross paths today. And, and he's now embarked on what I also think is an extremely important uh, a mission in life. For those who don't know, most of you probably do know, uh, he is president of the National American Constitution uh, Society. Uh, this is a an organization of law students, lawyers, judges, et cetera. It's often thought of as the left progressive uh, uh, equivalent of the Federalist Society, and they do somewhat similar things, but from a, usually from a very different uh, uh, point of view. Uh, very, uh, uh, I, uh, Russ, you may not be aware of this. I'm not sure I ever mentioned it before, but I, have, I had the honor of speaking at the first annual uh, uh, meeting of the American Constitutional Constitution Society when it was uh, first getting going. So I think I may be the only human being uh, who spoke at the first annual meeting of both the Federalist Probably. Society and uh, the American Constitution Society. And let me say, from the point of view of an educator in the law schools, how important organizations of this sort are. Because uh, both of them uh, have the practice of inviting scholars, serious people. These are not places where people sort of shout at each other the way you, you see on TV. These are places where serious people are invited to talk about serious, important things. And you know, sometimes they're debates, sometimes they're panels of, uh, of, uh, of other sorts. And this helps enrich the life of really of the law nationwide, but because of the chapters, how many people are here are from the uh, Stanford chap, members of the Stanford chapter of ACS? You know, uh, I'm surprised there aren't more. Where are your people? <laughs> today. Oh, you already saw them today. Okay, <laughs> good, good. Good, good, because uh, uh, what they do is they bring uh, the, this sort of thing into uh, the law school and in ways that our classes just can't. And so I just, as a, you know, sort of speaking, I don't really have a right to speak for legal education, but uh, <laughs> if I sort of can pretend, uh, thank you, Russ, for your uh, uh, work with this uh, important organization. I'm not going to talk much about the book because they're going to. In fact, I'm just going to shut up and turn the uh, podium uh, over. Uh, afterwards, you'll have a chance. They'll speak for usually, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour, 
Uh, this is m in intended to be a conversation, so please come up with your comments and questions. Keep them brief, but but uh, 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 please uh, you know say what's on your mind, and uh, we'll get that going. Afterwards, we're <coughs> having a reception to which everyone here is invited uh, outside, and you, we can mingle among ourselves and with uh, Russ and uh, and Peter and. Uh, Get your checkbooks ready and your <laughs> PayPal and whatever people you use to spend money with these days, because the book will be on sale. Welcome, Russ. Welcome, Thank you Peter. So much. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, it is a thrill to be back here, and I want to particularly thank the Stanford Constitutional Law Center for all the support as we worked on this project. Professor McConnell, of course, and Morgan Weiland, and all the people who really made a huge difference in making this happen in the first place. So thank you. Uh, I'm thrilled to be back here. I was here a lot between 2010 and 2020. It was the place I talked the most after my uh, constituents gave me my gold watch in 2010. <laughs> and uh, this became a place that, you know, I frankly really fell in love with. But, you know, I like to joke that. Uh, the, professor, the dean of the Marquette Law School sent me a note after I lost in 2010, and you know he was not a liberal. Uh, he was a, a guy who clerked for uh, uh, Justice Scalia, but he said, you know, we, we want people of different views here at the law school, and uh, that's exactly who Professor McConnell is. I like to say that you know I voted for him. And he was a Bush appointee, because I believed in voting for good people uh, regardless of their background. I didn't regret it. He was an excellent uh, uh, member of the court, and uh, he, uh, we really kind of befriended each other when I was here. And, uh, you know, this is an example of what can happen in this country if people of different views show mutual respect. And there can be no question that you can ask a liberal, you can ask a moderate, or a conservative, who are three or four of the five top constitutional law professors in the entire United States. They will always agree. Professor McConnell is one of those people, and that's great for Stanford and great for everybody here. <laughs> so before I, I sort of talk about how this uh, book came to be, Peter, would you like to say a few things if it gets you? Because you're an actual graduate here. <laughs> I was just a visiting professor. Well, I just want to echo the thanks um, to, to Morgan and Professor McConnell uh, and, and the uh, Stanford Con Law Center. Uh, the support of the center was absolutely critical to this book. Uh, both the, the provision of academic resources and the, and the, and the intellectual community. And, and just a, a, another comment, I, when we were, Russ and I were beginning original discussions about you know, whether or not to embark on this project, uh, I had a, a phone call with Professor McConnell from Woodstock, Illinois, my hometown, uh, during COVID. Uh, and uh, I asked Professor McConnell, you know, is this something that's worthwhile? And, and uh, he was so supportive. Uh, and it was really a, 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 a crucial moment in, in this project. And so we're just so grateful uh, to Stanford and to the law school uh, for, for their support. So the book uh, sort of had its origins in my uh, being able to try to teach law for the first time at Marquette Law School in, uh, in, in Wisconsin. And uh, the dean asked me to create a course that would sort of look at the Constitution through the lens of the United States Senate, the constitutional provisions that relate to the Senate, Issues such as war powers, you know, how is it that you're able to do filibusters, Senate rules, uh, all the different things that relate to the Senate. And it was a pretty unique course. I don't know that anybody had ever really taught that. So I worked on that course, but over time I started thinking about another element of this, having served 18 years in the United States Senate. And that was, you know, when, when members of Congress vote on a bill, do they think about whether it's constitutional? Do they decide to vote in part about whether it's constitutional or not? The answer, of course, is not very often, <laughs> but the answer also is they should, based on what the founders of this country uh, certainly intended. So I wrote a law review article about that, put it in the curriculum, and then I started thinking about, well, sometimes members of Congress are called upon to vote on whether to change the Constitution, whether under Article 5 uh, they want to propose an amendment to the states to be ratified. And that only happened a few times when I was in the U.S. Senate for 18 years, but there were some close calls. And so what are the st standards there? <coughs> Does a con member of Congress just say, well, let the people decide, or are there things they should vote for or they shouldn't? And that finally led me to realize that I didn't find anywhere in the country anyone have ever taught 
Article 5, having actually done a course just about how the Constitution can be amended. Where did this thing come from? How does it work? What does it mean that we have the hardest Constitution in the world to amend? So that got my interest, and I started to create a seminar about this, which I taught at the East Coast. Then I came here back to Stanford and uh, taught the seminar here. And I had a great group, mostly 1Ls uh, of students at one of these beautiful classrooms here. And one of the students was really good and uh, aced the class. And I asked him to become my teaching assistant, which he did. And uh, he helped me with the Senate course. And then we had to do remotely the, the, this course from, from our homes in uh, Middleton, Wisconsin, and Woodstock, Illinois, which aren't very far apart. Uh, but that's where we taught the Stanford students. And at the end, this guy says to me, Russ, you've got to write a book about this thing. This is a subject that hasn't really been covered, and it's, it's a threat of a right wing. Uh, constitutional convention needs to be portrayed, but also just the whole idea of how we amend the Constitution, how we should think about it. And I said to him, look, I just became president of the American Constitution Society. I can't do that on my own. Why don't we do it together? So that's how Peter came in. And it's a great feeling to have been a professor, just like, like you said, said, Professor McConnell. A year later, for me to be able to interact with somebody 40 years younger than I am, who was a student of mine, to work as partners on this has been a great pleasure. So uh, Peter, why don't you tell us about what the book is primarily about? So uh, as Russ said, it's the book is primarily about Article 5. Uh, Article 5 is the provision uh, that details how the Constitution should be amend can be amended. Article, provi Article 5 provides uh, that amendments need to be both proposed and ratified. There's two ways to propose amendments. The first is through Congress. If two-thirds of both houses of Congress vote to propose an amendment, it's then sent to the people of the states for ratification. But Article 5 also provides a second way to propose amendments, and that's through a convention. Uh, then amendments are sent to the people of the states for ratification. We can talk about how that works uh, later. But the book really finds its genesis in uh, this Article 5 and this convention mechanism. So you'll note the, the title of the book, The Constitution in Jeopardy. Uh, you might ask, why? What are the jeopardies? And so we argue that uh, there are two, two jeopardies inherent to Article 5 uh, uh, that are now impacting uh, <coughs> modern political life and the Constitution. The first of these jeopardies is a new effort uh, that really uh, started to gain steam during uh, President Obama's first term in office to activate uh, this convention mechanism in Article 5. We've never held a convention under Article 5 before, and uh, we don't really know how such a convention would work. And we'll, we'll talk about these, these uncertainties more in, de in, in detail later. But this vast void of rules and legal certainty provides a real danger. Uh, both for the Constitution and also our body politic. And so we argue that this is a real jeopardy that needs to be addressed. But the second jeopardy is also inherent in Article, Article 5, is the fact that it really is just too hard to amend the Constitution. We have the world's oldest written functioning national Constitution, but also the least changed. And we argue that uh, this has uh, posed a real uh, trouble to our law and, and to our politics. And so we propose the uh, final part of the book is a, a package of reforms, <coughs> thinking uh, how to, one, deal with this first jeopardy of this convention threat, and also address this uh, more existential question about ossification and stagnation. So, you know, we've only had 27 amendments to the Constitution in the entire history of this country, and the first 10 were right away. The Constitution probably wouldn't have been ratified had it not been for the Bill of Rights. There's only been 17 amendments history of this country. And there's never been a constitutional convention under the current constitution. Of course, there was one in Philadelphia, which was probably an illegal one under the Articles of Confederation. So that's where we're at. But a claim what, that Washington himself <laughs> thought was yeah, illegal. Which we can talk right. about. But yeah. so, um, so let me begin by saying a little bit, I'm sort of afraid of doing this in front of Professor McConnell, because he's a great expert. But I wanted to say a little bit about how they came up with this. What were they thinking? in Philadelphia in 1787. Well, as you may know, the convention began with the 
introduction on the putting on the table of the Virginia plan. And the Virginia plan had a number of things in it, and one of the things it had in it was a first proposal to allow for amending the Constitution, basically in the history of constitutionalism. What did it say? It said that there shall be the ability to hold a convention, but that the national government shall have no say in it. So the thought was no congressional role. That was then sent, as was much of it, to what's called the Committee on Detail. And they looked at it for a few weeks during that hot summer. And it came back out a little different. It came out saying a convention can be called, and Congress would declare the convention, but it gives no ability for Congress to do amendments on its own or to say, no, we don't want to do it. They have to. So it comes out. Alexander Hamilton says, no way. He says, the only good amendments basically going to be ones that the federal government, the national government does, because the states will be doing their own thing. It's the national government that needs to do this. And he wins nine to one to have it only be congressionally initiated amendments. But George Mason and some of the other founders say, well, fine, if you're going to do that, we're out of here. And so they had to make a deal. And near the very end, not quite the last thing, they put language back in that would allow both the congressional route that we're so familiar with, two-thirds of both houses, three-quarters of the states, but they also put in there this convention mechanism <coughs> with absolutely no indication of what the rules should be. All it says is if two-thirds of the states apply for a convention, then Congress has to call a convention. It's not, they're not going to vote on whether it's a good idea. They have to call it. And then there are no rules about how to count the applications, about what the subject matter should be. You can comment on what James Madison thought of that. Right. So it, it's clear even uh, you know, from James Madison's notes, which most scholars would say is the definitive account, um, or one of the definitive accounts of what occurred in, at the convention in 1787. James Madison remarked in his notes that this convention mechanism in Article 5 was flawed because there were, in his words, insufficient constitutional regulations as to form and quorum. Now, we could have an intellectual debate about maybe uh, Madison, you know, there's some scholarly argument that Madison edited the notes long into the future um, and that perhaps this is a statement about lived experience. But we would say that it actually was a fairly prescient observation that uh, this, this convention mechanism, a compromise as it was between the burgeoning Federalist and Anti-Federalist views that then would... Um, you know, come to more fruition during the ratification debates, uh, was that Madison was quite prescient in noting that this convention mechanism might have been half-baked. Uh, and so, uh, again, throughout history, uh, there have been attempts to invoke this convention mechanism, which perhaps we can discuss uh, later. But I think just one other point, um, thinking about the history of Article 5, we start the book, uh, our first chapter, which is called Bloodless Revolution, examines, we start the book not in Philadelphia in 1787, but we start it a decade prior, during the Revolutionary War. This is a real um, distinct decision, because we, started, we wanted to think about what was, it, what was the revolutionary generation thinking about these questions of constitutional amendment as they were drafting state constitutions. So we said that Article 5 is the first attempt in world history to draft an amendment mechanism for a national constitution that wasn't premised on unanimity, like the Articles of Confederation was. But there was also a really robust debate at the state level during the Revolutionary War about this novel question. If we believe that written law is fundamental, if we believe that we're throwing off the, the, the yoke of the king and that we, we will constitute a body politic on, on, the, on written fundamental law, we have to have a way to change it, right? Because otherwise you, you risk uh, tumult and bloodshed. And so there was this burgeoning idea in, 17, in 1776 and onward that America would encode this new, a new vision for bloodless revolution into our founding texts, that we would allow for slow, iterative change through constitutional documents that would allow the people to uh, 
continue to elaborate on and rekindle the animating ethos of the Declaration of Independence, that it's the people that constitute their government and the people are empowered to change it. And it's clear that this, these early understandings of constitutionalism and constitutional amendment that were evident during the formation of state constitutions also was evident at the convention. And uh, we argued that this is perhaps best embodied by what we call Washington's middle way. Uh, perhaps you want to talk about Washington. I mean, if you really distill this down, there were two major contestants about this process, uh, Alexander Hamilton and George Mason, who really were looking at different ways of thinking about this. Hamilton, of course, wanted a stronger federal government, but Mason reflected, you know, sort of the Jeffersonian view, which is you know, Jefferson basically said you, know, you need to have a new constitution or a revolution or there's different variations on it every 20 years. So this was the anti-federalist view. So when you look at the, the two parts of this thing, they're really in tension. They really could be seen as conflicting with each other. And the bloodless revolution piece really is the convention piece. Hamilton was not thinking about bloodless revolution. He was thinking about tinkering and fixing certain things to make the federal government work better. So in some ways, this, as Peter called it, the animating, animating ethos of this, had a lot to do with the convention mechanism. So I guess the point I want to make before I say a word about Washington is unlike January 6th or some of the other things that are going on, this independent state legislature theory, this is a legal thing that people are trying to do. That doesn't mean the way they're going about it is legitimate. But the idea of having a constitutional convention is not questionable in terms of the law. And I don't think there's any point in people suggesting that because there it is. So. Washington's middle way was that he understood in a, in a really amazing way, just like his humility about not wanting to be entombed or named in the capital or being king. He's like, look, we do not have the greatest wisdom of any time in human history. In fact, his, uh, his quote, uh, which is, uh, I happened to be at the National Constitution Center for the first time with my grandson the other day. 11 years old, and I looked up, and here's my favorite quote from him. He said, I do not think we are more inspired, have more wisdom, or possess more virtue than those who will come after us. That's an endorsement of rational amending. And you know, as Peter has suggested, Madison was even more conservative about this. He said you should only amend in the Federalist Papers on great and extraordinary occasions. Certainly, Washington didn't think you should do it Anytime he felt like it, but he thought that there would be moments when we'd have to do it and that a, a legitimate amending mechanism was important. Remember, no other constitution ever had this. So this is a big deal going and, forward. And Washington, you know, again, thinking about this Washingtonian understanding of Article 5, Washington, by many accounts, didn't really want to go to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. He, he was happy farming. He really resigned from public life. He goes uh, on the urging of, of Madison and others, in part because of, of contemporary problems, the Shays' Rebellion, uh, and the real uh, brooding, his real brooding concern that the new nation was going to fail because the Articles of Confederation were so troubled. Uh, and he goes to the convention, one that he said that he doubted its legality, which is a fascinating when you consider it in the context of Article 5 and these convention mechanisms. Uh, and most legal scholars would say that it was really his presence that gave the 1787 convention the legitimacy it needed uh, to engage in this drafting. After the convention adjourns uh, and, and sends its handiwork uh, to the states for ratification, itself overstepping the bounds of the amendment procedure within the articles, he says that the document as written was flawed. It had, in his words, imperfections. But he urged the citizens to adopt the document nonetheless, precisely because it could be changed. He said that, as Russ said, that ongoing generations will be able to mend any of these imperfections through Article 5. And he said that the Constitution should be binding on all until changed by an explicit and authentic act of the people. So it's clear in this founding moment that Article 5 in Washington's, and we would say other uh, framers' view, was really a cornerstone of the constitutional order. 
it was the embodiment of these earlier conceptions above this revolution that uh, the constitutional order can be changed through law. And so that's really the, the, the framework within which we both examine the contemporary issues in Article 5 and also the, the future of Article 5. So, you know, that's the background that we think is crucial and important for understanding what the founders intended and how this thing might work. But why are we saying the Constitution's in jeopardy? We think it's in jeopardy. And we indicated two different ways. Let me talk about the first one for a minute. Take a telescope back to the current, current moment. We obviously know it's a very tough time in this country. And uh, we believe that the far right is engaging in an attempt to call one of these conventions in a way that would be not illegal, but extremely damaging to the document that was created in Philadelphia and ratified by the states. You read nothing else in the book, read chapter five. What Trump and the Tea Party couldn't do. That's one of their quotes. My former colleague, Rick Santorum, former senator from Pennsylvania, former presidential candidate, this is how he talks about this convention. Doesn't sound like the founders. We're planning on putting resources, people in place to get us where the safety's off and we have a live weapon in our hand. Doesn't sound very friendly, but you know what? This is not just people masquerading or trying to scare people or raise money from direct mail. They're working really hard on this. They are preparing. In September 2016, reading from the book, over 100 state legislators from all 50 states gathered in Williamsburg, Virginia for a constitutional war game. The enemy, the federal government. The warriors, the who's who of the hard right establishment, the battlefield, Article 5. Yes, they did have a guy dress up as George Washington and do a video saying they were making history. So some on the left made fun of it, like it was a silly thing. My friends, it was not a silly thing. They really have put on an impressive show. They had tried it in 2013 and it didn't go very well. So they are working to improve it. Even to a casual observer, the debate would have been impressive. Delegates, the vast majority of whom are conservative Republicans aligned with the Tea Party movement, approached the affair seriously and engaged in good faith debate. Working committees parsed amendment texts, weighed the legal meaning of certain terms and phrases, and hashed out draft proposals. And so they really did this professionally. And then they decided to have a vote on which amendments to approve in this mock convention. And this is a critical moment. They didn't have all the delegates vote as a group. One vote per state. If you're concerned about malapportionment, think about it multiplied. Constitutional amendments being approved at a constitutional convention by a one state vote process. This is what they believe is appropriate under the Constitution, and we vigorously dispute that. And after I finish this piece, we'll have Peter go into that, because he does a great job of, of nailing this thing. But you know, people say, well, what are you worried about? What do you, what do you think they're going to do? Well, I think they could do things like a ban abortion and ban gay marriage, but we know what they're likely to do, because they did it at this convention. It was a hard right constitutional wish list. Number one, restricting Congress's lawmaking authority to a tiny fraction of its current extent. What do you think the, the federal government could have done about COVID in that situation? Secondly, restricting federal agencies' rulemaking authority. What do you think the EPA will be able to do about climate change or clean water after this? Virtually nothing. They would make the income tax unconstitutional, which the Supreme Court tried to do in, 19, in the late 19th and early 20th century, and it took a constitutional amendment to overturn it. And finally, their favorite, by all accounts, they've said it's their favorite thing they passed, is something that reminds me a little more of John C. Calhoun in the 21st century. They have a provision that they passed that would allow 30 states' legislatures, just the legislature, to vote to overturn any federal law or any federal regulation. Let's nullify it. This is what they want to do. And so we don't want to alarm people, we don't want to upset people, but certainly people should know that this is a well-oiled machine, well-financed machine. Peter can talk about the implications of, of, of this process. So the Jeopardy, it, it, it's not just policy proposals. Uh, it's also procedure. And, and in a lot of ways, the rules and the legal questions around Article 5 are more troubling than the proposals might be. 
because of course amendments still need to be ratified. So you can have uh, you can have a reasoned political debate about policy questions. But I think what really concerns us, in addition to the policy points, is, are these legal questions. We've never held a convention under Article V, and there's a vast void of, of uncertainty about how such a convening would actually function in practice. And as lawyers know, uh, in any kind of, of uh, legislative body, any kind of drafting body, oftentimes the rules in parliamentary procedure are dispositive. They, they uh, uh, are the most important question about how uh, uh, a convening or a, a legislative body of this type uh, functions. And so into this vast void of uncertainty have rushed all these new theories of Article 5, and we would argue even more fundamentally of constitutionalism and, and national union. So uh, what are these, these unanswered questions that are so troubling? Well, the first of which is, how are delegates actually selected, uh, and how would they vote? Uh, the current movement has posited, really pulling from thin air, arguably, that Article V conceives of a convention of states. They've imported an Articles of Confederation understanding of constitutionalism and applied it to the new constitutional regime. Uh, it's interesting, this new phrase was really divined in about 2010. Uh, it was a kind of a, a, a PR program to reframe the Article V mechanism. Uh, and now the phrase has be, really become common in parlance, uh, but has obviously no constitutional grounding uh, and, is, and is troubling. Um, you can, I mean, uh, we would point you to the first you know, line of the preamble, which says, we the people, it doesn't say, we the delegates of the states, as did the Articles of Confederation. So again, trying to really import a, a, a different way of thinking about constitutionalism and national union. And the amendment doesn't say anything about the convention of the states. It says states can apply for a convention, but it doesn't suggest that the states are the governors of how a convention would work. So and you might, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, and, and you can, in, uh, implicit in Article Five are alternative understandings of the locus of constitutional power. For example, uh, the uh, amendments can be ratified in one of two ways. They can either be ratified in state legislatures or they can be ratified in ratifying conventions. We've used that only once, but even then it's clear that the, the, the 1787 convention had, did not uniformly adopt a kind of state sovereignty understanding of constitutionalism. The understanding of, of, of our constitutional order was more complex and was grounded more in an understanding of popular sovereignty than it was uh, kind of the states as unique sovereign entities constituting the federal regime. And I'm reminded that uh, Professor McConnell was the one that really got me going on this, but he held a conference here that I was invited to a few years ago where we, some of us participated, conservatives, liberals, and others, and we sort of proposed amendments, and we kind of did a, a little convention. And I was corrected by one of the professors who supports the Constitutional Convention for not saying convention of the states. In other words, he was trying to make it this thing that doesn't actually exist. Now, you might say, well, are you guys really worried about this happening? It could happen very soon. Representative Jody Arrington of Texas introduced a resolution a few weeks ago in the House saying that there already are enough applications. What he's doing is counting various balanced budget amendment applications over time. Uh, and amalgamating them, even though some of them have been rescinded. And remember, there is no way that it, this thing can be limited that's to that topic. We should talk about that briefly, because that's One the second. other unknown. So yeah. uh, let me turn to you on that. Just after I say that if the House changes and they want to do this, they can just call a convention. Hmm. Who's going to stop them? I don't think the Supreme Court will. And that's not because of who's on the Supreme Court. It's because we don't even see the, really the authority of the Supreme Court to do that. So if this is done, and it looks like it's not a fair way of counting, which Peter will address in a moment, what we are looking at is a constitutional crisis that can't be resolved. And there are people that want that, people that are trying to demolish our democracy. And just if you don't believe me, ask Steve Bannon. 
Steve Bannon has adopted this recently as a, a top priority. He's referring to this as his top priority. And think about all his priorities. Just two, just a week last week yeah. on his and, podcast. Yeah, I mean, yeah. including dealing with the fact that he's been sentenced to jail. But, but you know, this is what's going on. So just to the other uncertainty is that the contemporary effort claims that these convenings can be limited, that their agenda scope can be limited to what they claim is a relatively um, discrete issue. Or we would question that on their own terms. But they really, there's no constitutional grounding for that claim, that these kinds of convenings can be limited. Um, they're not an outgrowth of state legislatures, and this, they're most certainly not uh, an outgrowth of congressional authority. It's clear from the, convention, the 1787 convention that the founding generation, again, baked into this kind of federalist, anti-federalist debate, saw the convention as a bottoms-up mechanism to check the federal regime, one that was distinct from congressional power. So the thought that Congress could somehow limit the agenda scope of this, this convening is, it doesn't really have much grounding. And neither can state legislatures, because uh, again, it's not really an outgrowth of state legislative power. So it's a Pandora's box. This convention could propose really anything save one. Article 5 provides that uh, the Senate uh, is exempt from uh, amendment. I'm so. reading Morgan's eyes. I think it's about time for Q&A. Let me just say oh, one yeah. quick point, which is we do believe that there needs to be changes in the way constitutional amendments are done because the constitutional amendments are needed, but we believe that would require an uh, Article 5 congressional reform that we do have proposals for. So if people are interested in And that, if you want to more ask, we have a, uh, whole, we, a whole kind of second chapter. Sort of yeah. yeah. uh, please come down to the microphones and speak into the microphone so that people, the, the tape, will hear your question. Um, my my understanding is there's no provision in the Constitution either for or against states seceding from the Union. Is one result that if the red states, half of, you know, of the country, called a convention, that the blue states would just not show up and say, we're out? I don't think there's constitutional authority for doing that, but certainly they could do it. I think this is one of our deeper concerns is there's a movement that's full speed ahead for this. And if we don't answer some of these fundamental questions about how the thing actually works in practice, there undoubtedly will be people who doubt the, the convening's legitimacy. For example, it's unclear how Congress should be counting all these applications. We didn't get into this, but there's a whole it's a really complicated question. There's a whole chapter about it. Over 500 have been submitted throughout history. So if Congress or you know, engages in some phony math, which is really being advocated now. It's the only way these, these advocates can get to the magic number. Um, it's quite possible that there would be um, citizens and perhaps states and state legislatures that see the, uh, see the convening as illegitimate. And that would be a real trouble. And, that, and, and there are people who have talked about if secession well, if they the can't get people. this. Yeah. We, we, we found people discussing that. Uh, apparently, a few days ago, Ted Cruz was asked about this in Texas and about secession. And he said, I'm not there yet. <laughs> so when you well, see that, you know it's part of the milieu. And the it's Texas part of this conversation. And it, they're often talked about in a similar breath, you know, in, in, within a breath of each other. The Texas Republican Party, now in their official platform, includes both uh, an encouragement to study secession and also to call a convention. So um, again, and we, we, we're approaching this question, I think, um, carefully. It's not that amendment is bad, and it's definitely not that constitutional conventions are bad. In a lot of ways, they could be good. But there need to be guardrails that can guide constitutional debate to the kind of high level that we would, we would aspire to. And that clearly is not the, the animating ethos of this current movement. And if we don't answer these questions, uh, we're setting ourselves up for real trouble. Uh, hello, thank you for the uh, the talk. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you would like to see constitutional amendments be a little bit easier to get through. 
Um, my question is, if we lived in a world where it was easier or if there was more just political will in order to kind of pursue constitutional amendments, how do you think that would change um, the nature of uh, constitutional interpretation on the Supreme Court? Do you think that there would be less of a desire to, you know, would people care less about the interpretation or would people, would it force people to kind of become more textualists or, you know, if we were able to kind of advance the Constitution, advance rights through this other means? I can try yeah. to answer. So, you know, I think there was a belief in our, at the founding of our country and even into the late 19th century that, that the Supreme Court could offer decisions but that the people could respond, and they did. The Supreme Court uh, invalidated uh, an income tax, federal income tax. And in a period of activism that involved calls for constitutional convention, the 16th Amendment was adopted to allow a federal income tax. So that's an example of the kind of interplay that one would think the founders would have believed in. I don't think the founders would have even believed that the Supreme Court would quite have as much power as it even had then. But the idea was we can correct it. And uh, the mechanism has become so hard and the difficulty of getting two-thirds because of partisanship has become so hard that that sort of normal response to what the court has done or would do is, is much less likely. I would just point you back to kind of where we started the conversation about um, the founding generation's understanding of constitutional change. And it's clear that there was a, a, a popular understanding to this. Uh, and an understanding that it would be relatively frequent. And I think if we were able to change a, 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 a culture that is now dominant in our politics, and it's most definitely dominant in the law, uh, that sees courts, lawyers, judges, academics, uh, as the only forum within which constitutional meaning can be derived, mm -hmm. uh, that hopefully we would have a new flowering of, 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 of um, popular sovereignty in a, in a more uh, we would breathe new life into the, into the claim that we the people do constitute the government. And I would hope that undoubtedly that would you know, require shifts in thinking about the Constitution and, and interpretive theory. And I would add, I would hope it would mean the Supreme Court is not quite so dominant in terms of our understanding and the people's role in the Constitution. The people should be involved in that, not just the Supreme Court. Thank you. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, it's, it's, it, you just raised the topic of popular sovereignty. My question was going to be directed at that. What is the role of popular sovereignty in America today? What has happened to that? And uh, are we left with only procedural mechanisms for changing the Constitution if popular sovereignty is no longer viable? I'm not certain how you mean the term popular sovereignty. Yeah. If you mean popular movements in the country that cause change, whether it's through congressional change, whether it's through Article 5, or whether it's through the Supreme Court. Uh, I certainly don't think that's dead. I think that uh, the fact that the Supreme Court ultimately responded to the gay marriage issue, and it was a tremendous change in attitude, was in a way an example of popular sovereignty that had an impact on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Um, but formally, the mechanism that the founders created is Article 5. There are those who <coughs> write about fundamental constitutional change as occurring outside of Article 5. Bruce Ackerman of Yale famously has posited that there have been two or three famous moments in American history, Reconstruction, the New Deal, that were fundamentally constitutional change. The problem is, though, with that kind of belief, and a lot of progressive and liberal professors have sort of hung their hat on the idea that those have written about super statutes, certain things that have become so much a part of the law that it can never change. And sadly, a lot of people thought that was what was true of abortion and the right to choose. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Yeah. It could be reversed by a Supreme Court. It could be re reversed by uh, a constitutional amendment. And so the idea that somehow um, just because something has been there for a long time What's the right is certainly proving now is we can't have those assumptions anymore. I just one other point is um, we we were uh, we 
were on, a, on a, an hour-long call-in show on Texas Public Radio about the book. Um, and the, uh, wonderful callers, and one, in, uh, one gentleman called in, and uh, he said, uh, you know, you seem to be for majoritarian rule, and, you know, that never ends well, and he said, you need to learn your history, you know, Athens failed, and America's not a democracy, he claimed. Um, and I just want to say is, uh, we're not saying that, you know, trying to inv invigorate an understanding of popular sovereignty through Article 5. It's not seeking majoritarianism. Uh, you know, fundamental law needs to be fundamental. It needs to be separate from the normal, you know, adjudicative and uh, uh, legislative process. But it's through the procedure, and we can debate kind of where to place the, the thresholds. But mm -hmm. it's about making it such that the people today can indeed, on their own accord, change the constitutional order. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So we're seeing a sort of rise in language that has been around for a while about the Constitution being uniquely or divinely inspired from people on the right. And I'm wondering if there's some tension with this and the movement of the people you're <laughs> writing about who are arguing for a constitutional convention, yeah. this long tradition, yeah. at least within some strains of conservatism, that's anti-amendment uh, sort of at its core. And on the second point then is if there's some tension there, is there some hope that this is breaking up the sort of political juggernaut that popular originalism has been, even if it's an actually a more reactionary alternative. Well, you know, the, this idea of the Constitution being divinely inspired really came up partly because there were so few amendments. And at the end of the 19th century, political scientists, including Woodrow Wilson when he was a political science professor, said, you know, this thing's done. It's basically impossible. You can get the quote. It's basically impossible to change it. it. It just looks like sort of a divinely inspired thing. Of course, what happened right afterward was 16th Amendment. 17th Amendment, direct election of senators, women's right to vote, and prohibition. So it blew that theory to heck. But uh, the idea was that, um, you know, that, that somehow it is. But I do think it puts them in a, in a tough spot because what they're saying is, yes, it was divinely inspired, but now we're going to completely rewrite it. It's kind of a tough thing to sell. Just on the, your political point, it's interesting, this um, question uh, of whether or not to pursue these applications, it's actually split some groups on the far, far right of, of American society. For example, the John Birch Society um, is, is vehemently opposed to this. Uh, and we, we, we're now being mentioned as allies of them, which is kind of, uh, it's, it's funny. Uh, not, not something that's often happened. I'm now, our, our names have been used in the New American Magazine, which is the John Birch Society uh, Gazette. Uh, so, you know, the world is fascinating. But, uh, uh, their, their critique is precisely along these lines of, of uh, leave, leave it alone uh, for, for, um, because they believe it to be this, this divinely inspired. And they have other concerns as well. I would just point you, it's fascinating, this question of kind of the divine nature of the Constitution and where this, this notion has been common in public life before. As Russ said, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, this was a common theme. Uh, and in our book, we have this wonderful photo uh, in the Library of Congress, and I wish I could show it all to you, but uh, it's where they used to house the Constitution before the National Archives was built. And it was in a, a box that looks like a tabernacle. <coughs> and it literally, there's a photo we have in the book, and scribbled on the back of it from the photographer in 1924 was written, the Shrine of the Constitution. <laughs> and all of these words were used, um, sacredness, reverence, shrine, they called Independence Hall the holiest spot of American earth. There was this real reverence in divine nature. Uh, and this was the very idea that inspired Woodrow Wilson, Herman Ames, who was really one of the leading constitutional historians and scholars of the late 19th century, to conclude that never again would the Constitution be amended. It was, it was etched in stone. And then just over the course of the following two, two, two to three decades, we had some of the, you know, uh, a flowering of constitutional amendment during the progressive era. And so we would just say, you know, this is part of our national tradition. We've had these moments of amendment fervor, and uh, we need to think intently about what that means about constitutionalism and also Article 5. Or should we take the last question? <laughs> uh, yeah, we have, I think we have a few more minutes, so we can. Yeah. We have Thank you so much. Congratulations. <clears throat> Thanks for your leadership. I'm a general surgeon, and I think I share your concerns, but I also think that this is an opportunity to perhaps amend the Second Amendment. You know, I don't understand the senseless violence 
every day in our emergency rooms, how it relates to the defense of the nation or a militia. I served in the military. I do understand the importance of the right to bear arms. But I'm just wondering, is this an opportunity, perhaps, you know, to utilize changing the Second Amendment as a way to push back against this effort? Or I think well, in listening to you today, maybe the best thing is to defeat any effort to convene a convention, but then I think a separate process to introduce amendments to the Second Amendment. Well, we, we didn't have a chance to get into detail about how we might change the, uh, the, the process by amending our But let me first of all say, if these folks convene this thing, they're not going to be repealing the Second Amendment. <laughs> They'll just take well, off the words, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of free state, and all that will be left is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not, shall not be infringed. So that's, that's for sure. On the other hand, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that, and I happen to be one of them to some extent, that there is some right to have uh, to bear arms. I'm a very liberal guy, but I did my senior thesis in college on my belief that there is some meaning of individual right. On the other hand, I happen to think that it doesn't mean you have a right to run around with a, with a, with a machine gun and that there can be limitations, and that's within the language. So, yes, a convention could take this up. I could see it be revived. I mean, I know from Wisconsin, for example, you know, even though it's a strong gun state, the vast majority of people believe in background checks. They believe in, you know, a number of limitations. And so you would think a rational process could do. I'm not sure you need a constitutional amendment to do that, but the Supreme Court is taking the Second Amendment to places it never should have been. And I say that as somebody that has been studying this for 50 years and do not take the view that there is no such thing as a right to bear arms. So, but in theory, yes, of course, this could be the subject of either the sort of convention we're worried about or a convention that could come from a different process. I would just add that your question really embodies the second jeopardy, which I wish we had more time to discuss. But really, the, 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 the problem that we, we don't have settled means that are have these appropriate rules and guardrails to engage in this kind of constructive debate about constitutional questions, um, and even in a way that you know can can, uh, as Article Five contemplates through convention, kind of go around the normal political process and from this kind of bottom-up understanding of constitutional reform. So it's just another example of how we we argue that the primary question on this on these topics is Article Five itself talking about the process of constitutional change and reforming that process. And doctor, I think your perspective on this is important. Thank you. I thought I'd ask a question. Um, maybe pushing <laughs> back boots. against the, <laughs> the ominous sense of the apocalypse uh, here. Uh, it is true, isn't it, that the product of any convention, no matter how nefarious the comp has to be approved by three quarters of the states. That's what, 37 states, 30, right? 30. Uh, how, well, why are you so worried? I mean, I can't, I can't imagine even a good amendment getting through <laughs> all well, 37 states, and, and I certainly can't imagine anything that would be, you know, really disturbing uh, uh, getting through 37 states. Well, my friend, I can't. And uh, here's why. 38 states, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? This thing doesn't happen unless 34 states ask for it. Uh. So it's only four states different. They went down and did this convention. They voted overwhelmingly for this. All they would need is four more gerrymandered states to do this. It's not easy, I'm not gonna say that. But I think 38 states, given the, the divide in this country, is by no means out of the question. Uh, and that's what we're worried about, is that this could create a movement could, that could capture at a given time the 38. I know Peter has another perspective. Yeah, I think, you know, Russ and I see this question a little differently, I would say. And I, I think it's, you know, it's a critique that's often raised, and I think it's a legitimate one. Um, I have kind of two responses to it. One, um, amendments can remain potentially remain alive for a very long time before ratification. Consider, for example, the 27th Amendment, which was pr proposed in 1789 and ratified in 1992. And so there's a long scope to this. State legislatures, if that's the mode of ratification that Congress decides, they change hands, 
they can engage in actions without a lot of public debate. It might not be the kind of forum by which we would want to be having these kinds of constitutional uh, discussions. Um, and I think the se my second concern, and again, understanding that 38 is a high bar, is that the process does matter. That if we allow a convening to endorse some of these pretty radical understandings of constitutional change, we might actually chill debate into the future. That it might settle for forever people's understanding that Article 5 really is dead. Uh, and, and that constitutional change through formal processes should really not have any place in public life. Uh, and, and so I, I see the, both of those as real troubles. And that's, again, why we end the book where we do, thinking about answering these questions of procedural reform, uh, understanding, of course, uh, that the framers did indeed uh, create this very challenging process. Last comment I'd make is there's no way that Steve Bannon and all these groups would do it, be doing this if they thought it was an exercise in futility. Mm -hmm. Make some money on it. There is that. <laughs> but I think Steve Bannon is not just into money. I think he's into changing our system. I have two more minutes. Can I ask another? And I'll speak. So if you could propose a single constitutional <laughs> amendment, what would be your favorite? You know, I go back and forth on this. But of course, I'd like to get rid of the Electoral College. But I think I'd like to see a right to vote in the Constitution. Because I think that what happened with Shelby in these decisions and gutting the right to vote is a problem. Now, maybe somehow it would be distorted, but we don't actually have a right to vote in the Constitution. I, I think that's a, a mistake. So I, this is another area where Russ and I kind of uh, debate and, and might come down on different sides. But I think um, uh, a, a prudent amendment that deals with campaign finance issues that deals with I'm citizens. A, I'm a fan of campaign finance. Uh, uh, but that, that does so in a way that um, is, is faithful to First Amendment principles, um, that, but that also addresses the real nefarious element of, of money in our politics today. Uh, and I think that's a hard question. It's a hard legal question. It's a hard political question. Um, but it's one that needs to be dealt with in, in, through, through, a, through amendment. And so. I think that the role of money has really done a lot of trouble to our politics, and it's a good procedural legal reform that can address it. And it, we happen to know somebody who's thought a lot about it as well. <laughs> so our time is now up. Please uh, join me in thanking our speakers.